Thank you, Sharon. I've known Sharon and Alicia and the girls for a long time. I thank you for your service to the Lord. All of you. How many of you have an anchor that holds? You have one? Boy, I do. That's Jesus Christ. Word of God today, let's turn to Hebrews. Just one verse for you today we're going to look at. And uh, here it is. One I like as well, but uh, in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 14. As we gather, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we throw open the windows, every door of our heart, to you. Let the fresh wind of your Holy Spirit blow upon this place, blow into our spirit where we've been polluted by the dirt of the world, the staleness of repetition, where we've been blinded by selfishness or downcast by disappointment. Let your wind blow it all away. We ask you to give us the wisdom of the day, Solomon. Give us the faith of David. Give us the strength of Samson. And most of all, give us the love of Jesus. We gather here today to seek your face in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our question for today is how has Jesus changed your life? If you could put it into words this morning, how has your life changed since you found Jesus? You had to write an essay for high school students. What would you write? What was your life like BC as opposed to AD? Before Christ versus after being delivered by Christ. Somebody said to me one time, I said, Pastor, Jesus has turned my life around 360 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hate to tell you, but that's not good. <laughs> it's got to be 180, we hope. Think about how he changed Zacchaeus. Think about how he changed Moses. Think about the Apostle Paul and the change that was wrought. How about Peter after the night? How has he changed your conversation? How has he changed your behavior? How has he changed your attitude? I've never been able to understand how people can be touched by the grace of God and be negative people. I've seen badness that smell flowers and look for humor. <laughs> we have got to ask, how has he changed? How's your stewardship changed? How has your sensitivity to others changed? Well, there's one word that I hope will describe that change. One word sums it all up, the change that Jesus will make in your life. And that word is holiness. I believe the supreme change that Jesus makes is that he makes us holy. A little girl was once asked, what's the difference Jesus has made in your life? She said, I used to run to sin, now I run from sin. That's the change. Holiness is the, is the right word. It changes our thinking. Have you ever noticed how fallen our thinking is without Jesus? I've got to tell you this story. I read this week of a guy that went fishing and he did not take his little boy. About halfway through the morning, the little boy said, Mom, can I call Dad? See how he's doing. She said, Sure, call your dad on the cell phone. The little boy rang his dad. Hung up and said, Mom, a woman at you. <laughs> Mom was hot. She was lit. When he got home from fishing that afternoon, Mom was ready to pounce. Y'all know what? How many of you know what pounce is? <laughs> she was ready to pounce. He said, What's wrong? She was like, Your son called you and a woman at you. Dad said, Son, come in here. He said, son, tell your mother what the woman said. The little boy looked at his mom and said, well, the woman said, 
The number of your calls go on the rock. Can you please hang up and dial me? <laughs> Have you ever noticed how I would think wrong, don't we? Anybody ever been, got any trouble with thinking wrong? Well, I have. We tend to think the unholy. We think the unholy about people. We think the unholy about God. Years ago, we were visiting a family in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I picked up the Charlotte Observer. And it had an article that immediately grabbed my attention. They had an article on a man who ran the adult establishments and strip clubs in Charlotte for 27 years. His name was Slim Ball. Now as I began to read that article, I found it so interesting because they had the picture that got my attention was Slim sitting behind a nice desk with a Bible on it. And I said, what's this guy in all the strip clubs and adult establishments in Charlotte Doing with the Bible. I want to read what the article said. I quote the article. Slim Balkan lives, makes a living from strip clubs. He worries that Jesus might not approve. Boy, that's a smart guy. <laughs> on the desk of his office with pictures of strippers on the walls is a Bible. He says, I read it every day. When asked if he was right with God, he said, no. I've not been saved and baptized, even though I go to church to believe strongly in God. He said, it's an internal battle I have within myself all the time. The strip club versus God aspect. There's a Bible on his desk that he reads every day. Do you know what the major issue was? What was Slim Baldwin struggling with? He knew that if he gave his life to Christ, he couldn't do what he was doing in his life. Yet many sit in churches doing that which they know they should and still <coughs> claim to be his. You see, Slim Baltham did not want to change. It's all about change. And it's a sad fact of our time that there is a disconnect between what's in the book, the Bible, and how people are living. People want salvation, but they don't want holiness. Or they want other people to change, but they don't want to change. Man who, the old mountain man went to the Asheville Hotel. Never been in a beautiful hotel before. He's raised in the backwoods of North Carolina. And he saw this door. And he saw an elderly lady with a walker go into this door and it closed. He'd never seen an elderly lady. Pretty soon that door opened again. A beautiful woman walked <laughs> He said, son, go get your mother. <laughs> God 
God gave the rainbow to say he'll never bring that judgment like that again. Isn't it interesting the homosexual movement has a rainbow flag? I'll tell you, the rainbow is not a, is being used as a symbol of the sins that caused the flood. Wow. They're waving the flag that caused it. People don't want to change. They don't want holiness. Today I want us to look at holiness. And the first thing I want to ask is, what is holiness? I believe that God will bless a church if, we're, if we understand and have his holiness. What is holiness? When the Bible it literally means to be set apart for God. But I wrote my own definition. So those of you that are taking notes, please take my definition. It is so superior to the list. <laughs> what is holiness? This is what I, I, I've got three or four things holiness is. Listen to this. I believe holiness is having and living the mind and the heart of God. That's a great definition. It's, it's, it's when you get the heart of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and you're committed to living His heart and life. Here's another definition of holiness. It's how I love God for loving me. He loved love me so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross for me. And He loved me on that cross. And holiness is how I live, how I love Him back. Holiness is my living to please Him instead of pleasing me. When I choose His way over my life, be holy. For I am holy, He said in 1 Peter chapter 1. That this morning, I want to share with you some pictures of holiness. And I want to describe holiness so we'll understand it clearly. And I've got six things I want to quickly present to you about holiness so you can grasp it. When I think about holiness and the holiness of God, the very first thing I think about is this. Holiness is experiencing the purity and the power of Almighty God. It's the purity and the power of Almighty God. How many of you ever heard the name Bill Moyer? Anybody heard of Bill Moyer? He was the press secretary for uh, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, I love the old story. Lyndon, jo Lyndon Johnson was having a, 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 a staff meeting, and uh, he asked Bill Moyers to pray. Bill Moyers was a Southern Baptist. So Bill Moyers bowed his head and started praying. President Johnson said, Bill, speak up. I can't hear you. Bill Moyer says, I'm not talking to you, Mr. President. <laughs> That's a true story. Bill Moyer writes about the launch of Apollo 17. In one of his books, he writes about it. I want to read it to you. It was December 1972, Apollo 17. It was a night launch, and there were hundreds of cynical reporters all over the lawn that had been sent to report on the latest of the launches. These cynical, bored reporters drinking beer, wisecracking, and dirty jokes, could bore them being disrespectful, but respectful, while waiting for that 35 story tall rocket to lift off. It was a scene of immorality while they waited. And then suddenly the rocket, he said, came to life. Everything around was suddenly lit up with a light you could hardly stand to look at. And the powerful noise from this rocket coming to life was felt through your entire body. It shook the ground. It shook people's lives. It shook the fillings in their teeth. They were shaken. They were blinded. He says, as it lifted up so majestically, you suddenly realize that there are humans on that awesome machine. As the first stage roared to full life with blazing blue that rivals the stars. 
said in the crowd suddenly there was a great silence. Everyone stood in awe as they watched that thing take off and, and head to the stars. And after it was gone, he says this, they began to help each other up, looking up amazingly and intently in amazement at the powerful display. He said, suddenly the awe they all felt made them moral people. They helped each other up, sobered from that moment as they contemplated the wonder they were seeing. They began to help people to the car and they began to clean up the mess on the lawn. And the, he said, these reporters that have been so disrespectful were certainly doing things reporters usually don't do. They were nice to people. <laughs> he said, they were touched by something awesome. Let me tell you something. One day, we're going to stand before an awesome God. The power exceeds Apollo 17, and we will be shaken so much that we will, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. People say to me, well, when I see God, I'm going to ask him why he did this. I'm going to ask God. I'm going to tell God what I think. No, you're not. <laughs> you see the awesomeness of God. You're going to say, as Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, Whoa, it's me, I'm undone. We need to realize the powerful God that we're going to see one day, the powerful God that made this whole creation that we enjoy, the powerful God. That let us go off into sin and then send his son to bring us back. That's the awesomeness of holiness. Reverential fear. That I carry with me wherever I go. Here's the second thing. I wrote down that holiness is the x-ray of all my God. Let me tell you why I said that. There was a man by the name of Rob Conrad who in 1981, he said that I knew, he said I, he didn't know anything about God. Rob said he knew nothing about God and his mother got saved. And she wanted Rob to get saved. She said, son, you need to get saved. He said, saved from what? He didn't know about Jesus. He said that his mom said, son, I want you to take a Bible, take it to work with you. He had his own company. He was the boss. She said, I want you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for a week. He said, okay. He said, on Friday morning, he uh, told his employees, leave me alone, I'm going to go to my office by myself. And he said that he had decided after reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for a week that he would accept Jesus Christ for Savior. He said, I didn't say any word. God just said, in my mind, he said, I know Jesus is Lord. And he's a savior, and I'm gonna make him Lord and Savior of my life. And he said, as soon as he said that, I want to read what he wrote. Without saying a word out loud, God all in my heart, I believe that you're the Savior. And immediately, without having spoken a word out loud, his presence of light blasted my entire being. At that moment, this light that blasted me, he said, he said, I felt divinely transparent with the tangible presence of his life. Now, this guy didn't know what to expect. This hit him out of blue. He said, no light like this could ever be anything other than God, which I knew instantly. Christ's virtues of life, truth, and purity were suddenly evident to me. And he said, this light saw all the way through me. Failed, realized that the holiness of God had shined through. I realized something. When you know the holiness of God, there is nothing hidden from Almighty God in you. The book of Revelation said Jesus has eyes of fire, that Jesus sees completely through you. That holiness, He knows everything in you. Listen to Hebrews 4:13. There is nothing 
There is no creature hidden from the sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, in Luke chapter 5, when Peter realizes he's a sinner, he falls in that boat and says, Lord, be merciful to a sinner. He knows everything. His holiness humbles us and makes us realize, as Isaiah 6, Isaiah said, Woe is me, I'm undone. Tell this, I have to put myself before his holiness. Third thing, not only does an x-ray ignore everything in you, then you must be clothed in his holiness. That guy said that I felt like God had screwed the top of my head off and poured liquid love into my spirit. He said, I suddenly felt the purity of God in me. Now, folks, I have never shared my testimony with you. I want to share it with you. I was not raised in a Christian home. My dad drank. He was hard-headed. I got some of that. He uh, lost several jobs. I called him his big mouth. My dad was not a Christian. My mom had been a Methodist and she'd been raised, but when she married him, she quit going to church. We never were Christians together. Rarely went to church. Occasionally on Easter, we go to mom and carry us for an Easter service. I might go to church five or six times before I found Christ. Nineteen years old, I had lost my driver's license for breaking an injury. And I met this Young girl over here, blonde hair. She wasn't blonde then. <laughs> she said, You're going to love me when I'm old and gray. I said, I'll oh, love you through three other colors. <laughs> she said, I'll, I'll drive you around. I'm also going to drive around. I'll drive you around, but you got to go to church with me. I've never been to church. She played in York. I would sit on the front of her and sweat during the whole service. I didn't know what was going on. Never been in church. In the revival service one day, they asked, I, I, if I'm quick, I need Jesus. If I'm quick. But I told the pastor, I want to talk with him after the service. He carried me back to the nursery. He shared some scriptures. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you'll be saved. He said, do you believe that? I said, well, yeah. He said, would you pray to ask him to come into your life? I said, yes, but I don't know how. He said, let me lead you in prayer. I said, okay. We got on our knees in the nursery of the, that little Baptist church. And I just said what he said. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me and rose again. When I said that, suddenly I felt something come into my life. I felt the cleansing like I had never felt before. I was clean. Folks, I smiled for three days. I couldn't quit smiling. I left that church and told my best friends, I just got saved. And they left me. They mocked me. But you know what? I couldn't keep it quiet. It's like a Mississippi squirrel. Something got a hold of me. <laughs> Folks, I want you to know something. Holiness is, is the gift of Him coming into your heart. Number four, I want to say something else about holiness. Holiness is both visible and progressive. The question is, are you, is holiness instantaneous or progressive? I want you to write down something for me. 2 Corinthians 7 1. 2 Corinthians 7 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, it's unholiness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Holiness is the gift He gives you that then I have to learn to take over my whole being. His holiness then takes over everything I do. It is holiness is living my life 
every day surrender to Jesus Christ. And that takes a lifetime. Here's number five. Holiness equips you for service. And most of the people don't realize that. Holiness equips you for service. Isaiah, when he was cleansed in Isaiah chapter 6, said, he heard the Lord say, who will go for me? Isaiah said, here I am, send me. He was ready to serve. Because once he touches you with his holiness, he expects you to bring that holiness to an unholy world. Every year, in West Palm Beach, Florida, Christian doctors gather to share stories. It's in West Palm Beach, Florida. It's the uh, annual World Christian Doctors Network Conference. If you want to know what it is, you can look it up. A couple of years ago, a doctor by the name of Chauncey Crabbe, the Foy. Who names your child Chauncey? <laughs> Chauncey Crandall the Fourth, medical doctor. In that meeting, he shared a story that happened in his emergency room that year. You can find his mother. Johnson said that a man had a heart attack and brought in and they could not revive him. He was 53 years old, and part of the procedure in their hospital is that uh, once somebody pronounced dead, another doctor has to come in and verify the dead. He was called to come in, verify this guy was dead. He said, I looked at him, his feet were black, his legs were turning black. He, it was obvious he was dead. He said, uh, I, he said I, I agree, he was man has died. He said, as I was walking out of the emergency room, the Holy Spirit said, you go back and pray for that man. He said, I believe there's an audible voice. Go back, pray for him. And he said, I immediately turned around and went back. He said, I sat on the edge of that stretcher and thought, well, what do I pray? And he said, suddenly words came out of my mouth. Now follow me on this. Suddenly these words came out of my mouth. My Father God, I cry out for the soul of this man. If he does not know you as his Lord and Savior, raise him from the dead right now in Jesus' name. He said the heart monitor lit up. The man's heart started beating. His legs had been black with dead. He was getting rigid. The heart monitor lit up. It also lit up by where the nurses were. The nurse came running in and said, Doctor, what'd you do? He said, I just prayed. They rushed this man to intensive care, according to Dr. Crandall. He lived and he didn't have any brain damage. And he said, I went to see him a few days later. And he said, Doctor, I was in the darkest place you can imagine. Anybody want to guess where that was? He said, I felt like I'd been thrown on a sheet. There was nobody there. It was dark. It was terrible. It was lonely. And he said, I told him he'd been in hell. He said, I told him about Jesus. He said, right there in that bed, he said, I want Jesus as my Savior. He said, that man accepted Christ as Savior. Dr. Crandall said, I followed that man for a little while. Found out his story. That man had divorced his wife 20 years prior because she was a Christian. He couldn't stand me around. He couldn't stand me around better around her holiness. Like the story of Billy Graham played golf with some guys. They said, don't slap play golf with Billy Graham. And one guy said, I can't stand all his preaching. Well, he never said a word. It was the holiness of God. This guy divorced his wife 20 years ahead, but what he didn't know is she'd been praying for his salvation for 20 years. Word had come to her that he'd had a heart attack. She got on her knees and began to pray for him to be saved. And it was that prayer, I believe, that caused God to speak to that doctor to say, well, wait a minute, go back and pray for him. The point's this. Your holiness makes a difference. 
Your holiness makes a huge difference. When you are unholy and you're polluted by the world, you're ineffective for the kingdom of God. That's why God offers us opportunities. First John 1 9. If you we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we have sins, we have an advocate with the Father. We must continue to be pursuers of holiness because holiness then equips us to lead people to Christ. The more, write this down, the more Satan stains us or the world stains us, the less we feel worth to do the work of holiness. Don't we? Holiness is costly. Let me tell you one more thing. I won't quit. It's costly. Hebrews chapter 9 says that Jesus was a sinless Son of God. That's why he was born of mercy. He was the sinless sacrifice for our unholiness. You see, God, in the very beginning, I mean, this is how it works, guys. When Adam and Eve sinned, Something had to die for their sin. God said this, the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Wages of sin is dead. Adam and Eve sinned, and, and what did God do? He clothed them with the skin of an animal, didn't he? Something died. Throughout history, as you read the Bible, you will find that God didn't establish the system. Remember Cain and Abel? Cain killed Abel because Abel bought a sacrifice for his sin. Something that wages of sin is dead. The sacrificial system in the Old Testament was that if you sin, you brought something to the altar and it had to die in your place. If you were rich, you had to bring cow, the bull. If you were poor, you bring turtle dove or a lamb. Now I'm not going to say uh, whether this is a full bull church or lamb church or whether it's a turtle dove church. But you brought something that died in your place. But God said, I'm sending later on one sacrifice to die in your place. To end it all. And that, therefore, he sent his son Jesus. That's what Jesus did. He died in our place. And here's the question. Why will God not allow sin in heaven? People say, well, I'm going to go to heaven just because I am. No, you can't go as you are. You're a sinner. Why does God not allow sin into heaven? Because if he let sin into heaven, it wouldn't be heaven anymore, would it? It would be just like this place. But those that are allowed in heaven are those that have received the cleansing, have received the holiness that Jesus died to pour into your being like he did me. And others. And when you say, Lord, here I am, I want that cleansing. Then God, by faith in Jesus, that He is that sacrifice, He comes and brings His holiness to you to equip you for eternity. Folks, that's how it works. I wanted you to hear that today because I wonder how many slim balkans we have in this church. How many people here today, like that guy in Charlotte, North Carolina, got a Bible on his desk? He's not living the life. Isn't it time that you surrender to his holiness? To live it, letting him live his life through you. By responding to your love response to his love for you. He's looking for a holy people. And he's looking to walk among the people who will be holy because they received Jesus. If you never received Jesus, would you do that today? You're going to have to give up some things. It's going to be a different life. But I'm going to call you to a changed life. And if you can't tell that he's changed you, Maybe you need to have Jesus in your heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven,
brought judgment on this world because of unholiness. You destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of unholiness. But you sent your son to settle the issue of holiness. And all who would understand that he's a sinless sacrifice, you would make holy. Father, today as we come to this moment when your spirit is speaking, Lord, I wonder if some of your calling son come back to holiness, to be a holy people of God. They've forgotten what it's all about. If there's somebody that's never accepted Jesus, he's not in their heart. They know who he is, they respect him, but they've never accepted him. Would they right now, Lord, I pray they'll just say, Jesus, I want what Bob Cranley got. When that light shined upon him, you poured yourself into him. He felt the power of God flow in him. Lord, I, I, I want to know that cleansing that comes from faith in Christ. Father, there's somebody here with that cleansing now. I pray they'll pray a prayer like I prayed when I was here. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I know I'm a sinner. I want you to come and live in my heart. I believe that you're the Son of God who died on that cross for my sins and rose again. And I ask you to come in now. Reside in me permanently. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me. That I might be brought in the stone. And begin to wreck my life from this day forward. As I give my life to you and live in living letting you live your holiness in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, thank you for listening. I believe that Baptists, a lot of Baptists have never heard a message on holiness. I believe that's the message that we need to have this last day again. Because the time's coming when unholiness is going to rule this world. That's before Jesus comes back and we're moving forward. We have an altar. You can come and kneel right here. You don't need to talk to me. If you want to come and say, Lord, I want to dedicate myself to a holy life for Jesus Christ. Come and kneel and go right back. You prayed that prayer with me and asked him to come in for the first time. Would you shake my hand? Come down, shake my hand. Say, Pastor, today I was going to take Jesus as sin. I understand what it's about. And I choose Jesus. Would you? Let's stand.